Professor Dovchis, what sparked your interest in mathematics? My father himself was an engineer, and uh, I, I, uh, when I was a, a child, I mean, I really idolized my father. And so I wanted to uh, be like him. And so originally I wanted to do engineering. But uh, I then realized that trying to find out why things work is not really what engineers do most of the time. And so it shifted towards physics. And in fact, my degrees are in physics, but uh, I had to learn a lot of mathematics while I was doing physics. And I, I really liked the mathematics and I liked uh, seeing how the mathematics was useful, not just for physics, but for many other pursuits. Can you describe the arc of your scientific career, say from undergraduate to present? Okay, so as an undergraduate, I was in a physics major and I chose theoretical physics. For my PhD, originally I was going to work on uh, elementary particle physics, theoretical and elementary particle physics, and I learned quite a bit of mathematics doing so. But I, I got interested more in the intricacies of some of the mathematics there, and so I was interested in quantum mechanics. So this, this, this duality between position and momentum plays a role, and that's expressed mathematically by the properties of what's called the Fourier transform. And so, uh, but the Fourier transform is useful in many other contexts. It's useful for anybody who's interested in decomposing things like spectrum of light or um, sound in low and high uh, pitches. And so audio engineers are dealing with Fourier analysis all the time. And so many of the uh, techniques I have developed as or learned or constructed as tools that I had constructed as a, uh, in, in mathematical physics would also be useful in completely different settings. But because, because I came from a different uh, background, I had a different point of view. I mean, as a physicist, you think much more about phase space, about the two things at the same time, the duality, while uh, engineers are very used to dealing with signals in time and then putting them in the time domain. And they reasoned at that time almost exclusively in the frequency domain instead of the time domain. And so they would think about aliasing and, and, and all kinds of phenomena, not losing track of, but not really exploiting the fact that it all came from time phenomena. And because I had much more than duality, it really uh, helped me make that transition and do things that they might otherwise not have. And so, uh, after my thesis, I became interested in, in these applications to signal analysis and uh, started becoming interested in questions that, that existed there and how the techniques I had might give me a different approach and a different answer. And it all went from there. And I got interested in image analysis, uh, wavelets, and, uh, and then it was a very heavy period where, on the one hand, there were applications to engineering of these uh, constructions. But on the other hand, uh, even though they came from engineering, we then realized that we had this connection to a very deep vein that went back a long way in mathematics, where very beautiful results had been proved. So all of a sudden, there was this, this, this confluence. It was almost like uh, a little uh, dam breaking through, and all of a sudden we had this flood of, of fantastic mathematics that we could use, and that immediately had fantastic applications. And so we understood many more things. And, uh, so that was a great moment. I mean, there was a period in the 80s where we had conferences to which engineers would come, and physicists, and mathematicians, and pure mathematicians, applied mathematicians, and we would all talk together, and it was very exciting. And um, in that particular area, that has subsided a little bit because uh, everybody absorbed everything they could from everybody and then went back to their own communities and still talk about the big influence that, that, that was had there. And there's still people who do talk a lot about, uh, across the boundaries, but the big heady moment is, is, is no longer there. But I think it led many uh, mathematicians and engineers to realize that they were there was a potential for fantastic contacts. And uh, right now, mathematics is very exciting because um, in a, a later development now, we are now trying to, to deal with and construct tools to deal with enormous data, uh, 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 very complex, very rich data, um, 
that we can acquire and store and don't really have good tools to analyze. And uh, there are, again, people from def different directions who uh, want to work on this together, who, who realize that expertise from many different directions will be needed for the best possible mm -hmm. way of working on this. And uh, I've, I'm seeing people who work in, analysis, in, in, in mathematics branches that previously did not maybe have such applications becoming interested. And so uh, people from the factual geometry, people from topology, people from, from uh, are talking with statisticians, are talking with electrical mm -hmm. engineers. And I think new mathematics will emerge from that. So it sounds like some highlights in the development of your career. Uh, in graduate school, you were studying quantum mechanics and these semi-classical aspects gave you a perspective on phase space informed by physics. And this perspective enabled you to see things differently than the way the engineers saw things uh, typically when studying signal analysis. Is that a fair assessment of the early launch? Yes, I think that is, that is uh, very not only fair, but a very accurate assessment. And then after things started to develop, you mentioned that a deep vein of mathematics emerged as becoming new. Was it a new vein or an old vein? That it was an discovered? old vein, but it's, it was an old vein and people who lived in this area of harmonic analysis knew that they had very powerful tools, but uh, they, they lived in, in their community and uh, were developing fantastic and improving very hard theorems, which they all appreciated. I don't know whether they themselves had uh, realized the extent to which the ideas they were developing could really have computational importance. And that breakthrough, the, uh, uh, the realization that it could be this computational importance, I think came mostly from outside the field. But uh, it was because of a few key figures in the field who, when they heard about it, uh, had the first, the first natural reaction was, oh my, they're rediscovering what we've known for ages. I mean, it's a very mm -hmm. human thing to do. But then they went beyond that. They said, oh my, but people look a little differently at things. What is it? What is the difference they, that they bring? And so looked at it in more detail. And that way a bridge was made. Mm -hmm. Instead of, 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 of saying, oh, they're rediscovering something we knew. I mean, uh, oh, silly them. Uh, it was, oh wow, they look at it differently. Maybe it's useful for us. Maybe we can, let's translate what they do in our language and see what it does for us. And so then there was a, a, a mix that happened. I mean, and I think the signal analysis benefited enormously from all the insights and from absorbing all the knowledge. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, part you, of the knowledge. Can you talk a little bit about some of the applications of this convergence of ideas in the 80s that you described? What are the applications of this convergence that influence us today? Okay, so uh, uh, what emerged in the 80s was a synthesis that's called wavelets, construction of wavelets. And uh, wavelets are building blocks that help you decompose complex phenomena, sounds, functions, operators, images, into uh, uh, smaller so building blocks. But the special uh, aspect of wavelets is that you have uh, for things that are slowly varying, you have wide wavelets, and for things that have a very sudden change happening, you use very narrow ones. So it's as if you were trying to paint a scene with broad brushes, and then superimposed on that, you switch to something smaller, and then you superimpose on that. And so on. It's not really how a painter works. A real painter knows what he's going to paint, or is she going to paint, and, and will save, I mean, doesn't paint layer on top of layer, typically. But if you did it naively, I mean, you might do something with a broad and then fill in, the, add smaller detail, and then with a very fine pen, add even smaller detail. And that is something that we would allow you to do. And that's uh, this idea of trying to zoom in where you need to, but not doing it where you don't, is inherent to mathematical uh, tools that had been constructed in harmonic analysis and that were developed in order to be able to look at singularities, integral kernels. So singular integral operators needed this mathematical zoom and so people developed it and they wanted to work in circumstances where they couldn't have just before you transform. Mm -hmm. And so they had developed this machinery 
with which they proved powerful theorems. But what made that machinery work to prove the theorems was also what was really needed in order to make things work to analyze images. So does, does this technology influence most people in the world, or is it extremely refined? And uh... Well, it's, it's now, now these wavelets have become part of what's called the JPEG 2000 standard, which is the standard that is used for many internet applications of image compression. It's used in digital cinema in, uh, in, in, in uh, North America and in Europe. It's used for ESPN broadcasting of, of sports events. I mean, so it's all pervasive. People don't know it, but it's there. And how does uh, this fantastic widespread application of these ideas, uh, which certainly shows their relevance, how do you view the influence of that historical vein uh, mm -hmm. on the applications? Oh, I think it's, it's, it's really incredibly important because when wavelets were first developed, I mean, the first instance, the first spark of wavelets in the application, uh, they seemed to work for miraculous reasons. And we had, I mean, we had some ideas how or why, but uh, the real understanding of how they could work as well as they do came through that synthesis with the whole mathematics. I mean, that gave us the mathematical tools to understand uh, why wavelets were as powerful. Plus, it immediately led to many other applications of something that had been developed for some signal analysis purposes, and it became a much wider, uh, much more widely applicable tool uh, that's used for numerical computations, uh, for, for uh, partial differential equations. I have used them in uh, a geotomography project where we were trying to interpret uh, seismic traces from uh, huge earthquakes of the last 30 years in order to reconstruct better the, uh, uh, the structure of the, the mantle of the earth. Uh, I mean, many applications where they would probably not have been used stemming straight from only their signal analysis background if we hadn't understood all these mathematical properties. Also, their mathematical properties made them a very good tool for a lot of statistical analysis. Uh, it turns out that the wavelets that were constructed are what's called unconditional bases, and that is something that is really, what that means is that they are the right tool to decide how close things, how similar things are to each other, or how, how close they are to each other, uh, in many different settings, depending on whether you want to pay attention to spikes, or to smooth things, or to certain edges, or so many different settings that statisticians, where statisticians want to tease out some features rather than others, uh, turn out to be very well described. So long before the 1980s, this vein of mathematics that you uh, describe as informing and helping to advance this uh, incredible wave of applications. Was it clear at that in, in history? Could one anticipate that this uh, rich vein of harmonic analysis ideas would have these vast applications? Well, no, I don't think so. I so how, how do we assess then the value of research, of proposed research in pure mathematics? Uh, if someone presents you with a research proposal, yeah. what kind of cues do you look at to assess whether or not it is something worth investing in? Uh, well, I, I, I try to read and understand what's in there and see whether indeed uh, what is proposed as interesting questions are really intriguing. And if it's an area too far from my own, I mean, typically I would not be asked to judge things that are way off, mm -hmm. off, off left field for me. But I think whether it excites other people in the field uh, is, is usually a very good indicator. Uh, we all are curious about patterns and structures and, and so and so uh, mathematics research is a very human pursuit. It's mathematics is things, it's stuff that we construct in order to understand things. And we then ask, start asking questions. I mean, look, there's this corner which we haven't really understood, but I think it's related to that. Uh, can we find it? Can we understand that? And somebody else says, oh wow, you know, that reminds me of this. And new mathematics gets constructed that way. And um, when you look at, at big mathematical prizes, for instance, they're often given for people who connect things that were not connected before, 
all of a sudden there's a shaft of light because of a new connection being made. And so I think you judge by how it excites people in the community, how things work. And, and new developments then people work very hard to really understand them. Because very often the first person who understands, understands it vaguely, I mean, has an intuition, tries to articulate it and gets somewhere, but then that insight helps other people and they articulate more. And that's how we together build the whole framework. And then that framework gets absorbed by more people and becomes part of our, of, of our toolbox. And then it's available to do other things with. And I think that's what happened with harmonic analysis. I mean, it, it uh, things that were developed in the 30s, I mean, Little Wood Bailey, I mean, uh, 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 Lucinator, I mean, all these, these, these developments were interesting, exciting, made things connect. I mean, Little Wood and Bailey were telling us that things that you couldn't do with Fourier were things that you could do if you grouped Fourier stuff together in the right way. It wasn't, you could still read it off even though it seemed hard. Uh, so that was interesting. You go further and further, and so then you have a whole framework, and it's coherent and so on. And then when a connection happens, you have that that whole material. It's like having a whole warehouse of stuff, and uh, you get you get referred to it by somebody because you worked on a project, and you go there, and they have all the pieces that you need for your project instead of having to reinvent them. I mean, and uh, which is great. So you mentioned curious. Yes. Curiosity driving some of these advances. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people refer to curiosity driven research as frivolous as opposed to practical applied research. Well, but, I mean, aren't we aren't we the curious mammal? I mean the curious primate. All primates are curious, but we are I think more curious. We are curious. Uh, I mean to be less 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 frivolous there. Uh, I think being curious about things and observing things that are not the way they are and trying to make them better is a very, very basic human pursuit. I mean, I think it's it's what drives us in many ways of life, not just science. I mean, it drives politicians, it drives, I mean, it drives everybody. Uh, just observing, trying to understand, trying to see a pattern and trying to see, can we understand that better? Can we do something with it? Can we, if we do this with it and this with that, what will that do together? I mean, it's what babies do all the time. I mean, they observe the whole world and, and that's how they learn. Uh, they learn to, to speak, they learn to walk, they learn to, to, to think. They, uh, it's, it's just continuing what, what makes us us. I don't see how anybody can say we're curious. Of course, from time to time, there are moments where you say, okay, Time to stop and be serious about something else because there's urgency there. But then, as soon as the urgency is over, I mean, that's what civilization is for. So to, to give us the time to do more things, to be more curious about, it, not to have to toil all the time and spend every moment of our time to produce our food. So earlier you mentioned uh, emerging new challenges arising yes. from the explosion of so many different kinds of mm -hmm. data. Uh, do you see different veins of pure mathematics informing oh, those developments yeah, in a I way see, analogous to what happened in the 80s? I see uh, already some of them informing that, but on the other hand, it's happening right now. And so it's harder to say, uh, I mean, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, people may be able to say more because I think it's happening also at a deeper level. Uh, and I think it may well be something that leads to uh, new mathematical subfields emerging. Uh, I hope so, because that's the exciting part. Uh, what's with hindsight? What's happening is uh, what happened to wavelengths was one instance of something that we're trying to do at a much larger scale now. So wavelengths were a first instance of a different type of way of approx of, of approaching building up something from building blocks. Uh, in other early instances, of which there have been many in physics and engineering and mathematics, what people were trying to do was decomposing into building blocks, which then sequentially became less important. The first few were the most important, and then, and you stopped after a while, after 100 building block, because it wasn't doing much anymore. With wavelets, uh, you when you decompose an image into wavelets, you try to, you have uh, at your disposal 
thousands, hundreds of thousands, little bit of books. And every image is only used, going to use very few of those. But it could be any of those hundreds of thousands. It could be the first 10 and then somewhere one with a label that starts with 200,000, or it could be uh, some other mix. But it's always just a few from the enormous mass. So that's an example of what we now call sparse expansions. We are trying to build techniques, and this, this field is called machine learning, which is a misnomer really, because it's not just that you, you put a whole lot of machines observing things and they learn. I mean, we, we're trying to find the patterns by means of which if you get a whole lot of data that are of similar nature, like images, you try to identify the right building blocks of which we then will be able to decompose every single instance of this data with just a few building blocks. But you know that the whole collection may be important. It's not that the first few you're going to find are more important than the, 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 the hundredth one. It's just you want to find a collection so that, and the collection is going to be big, is, is bigger than what's called the dimension of the things you look at. But uh, you have many more data than the dimension, and you're trying to, to find the right way. And wavelets turn out to be the right uh, dictionary of building blocks for images. Uh, but we, we had them there by a little bit by accident, and then this, this, this whole vein of mathematics was, was helping us identify why it was those building blocks that were so important there. But we're now looking at data structures that we don't understand, that come from mixed media that are huge, where, where we don't have insight in the, way, the same way as we had for either singular integral kernels or images. And we're trying to learn the right building blocks. So I have two more questions. The first is, speculate 10 or 15 years from now. Suppose that the types of advances that took place since the 80s in wavelets take place in this field that you're describing right now. What are the things that we might be able to imagine occurring? Um, I think we might imagine uh, looking at extremely complex data like we get from biology, like we get from observing ecosystems and so on, and disentangling much better than we can do now what the important features are, what are the important, what, what makes the whole thing click, what makes it Pulse, what's the life in it? What 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 influences what? I mean, so I I, I imagine that we will be able to to develop tools that, although I don't think they will be equivalent to what we can do, but that intuit in a certain sense mathematical tools that take lots of data and that help us get out of it uh, well the big patterns the big structures I mean I mean uh, intuitive I think is a good word although it's uh, I, I spent uh, on sabbatical I spent three months in Madagascar at a biology station and it was incredible for me when I went to the rainforest I mean it was beautiful wonderful and I would not see a single animal even though it was steaming with them, because I hadn't learned to see there. And I thought, well, I'm not a biologist. But there would be field biologists that would come that had been in Costa Rica, in other tropical rainforests, and they would arrive, and they would not see a single animal the first two weeks, unless they were with a local guide who would point them out. But after two weeks, they would start seeing. So they had absorbed all this, and started to sort it out. Now, children, babies do this all the time, they learn the whole thing, but we can still do this at an adult age. I mean, the biologists were doing it, of course, they were very motivated. Uh, to do this, we use a faculty that we haven't understood at all. I mean, we call it intuition, we call it learning and so on. We are going to be able to do some of that, I mean, with, with tools we are developing now. Okay, my last question. With all of these changes that have taken place that you've described in the 80s and that are taking place now, do you see new advice or different approaches towards the training of mathematicians? How should young people begin to be prepared for the challenges that are upcoming? 
Uh, okay, I think I'd like to answer that in two ways. I think there's a, a challenge to uh, people like you and me who train young mathematicians. I think we should uh, think of ways in which we uh, make it possible for young mathematicians to talk to people in the other sciences more than I think we were trained to do in the past. I think it's extremely useful, fruitful, and uh, important. I mean, I think it's important at many levels. I think it's important for mathematics itself uh, to get this contact from application fields because I think it fertilizes mathematics. Uh, but I think it's also important for how mathematicians are viewed in the world. I mean, I think for too long we have done beautiful things, powerful things, and not told other people about what importance all this stuff had, and we, we kind of, of, of uh, were uh, relying on it seeping out at the edges somehow, and, and then acquiring importance. And, uh, and I think that's not enough. I think we should play a more active role. But the other thing, I mean, training young people, I think uh, I have students who ask me, uh, who want to work with me, and so I know what they should learn in order to work with me. And then they say, there's this course on algebraic geometry that sounds really interesting. There's a visiting professor and so on. Can I take it? And I say, if you have time and appetite for it, you should take it. You should learn all the mathematics you can. All the mathematics you have time for, you want to learn. I have personally not learned a single piece of mathematics that I have regretted learning. I mean, I and I've used most of it. Uh, and I didn't know ahead of time what I would be able to use. I mean, I'm here for... Uh, for the Lacket program. I mean, I know very little about that, but to the lectures I went to, I learned something. I learned that they are actually pursuing a, a, a union, a, a meeting of different points of view that I found extremely inspiring. So I'm going to try to learn more about it. Thank you.